Welcome to Overthinking Eurovision, formerly known as the Golden Girls Appreciation Society. I'm Matt Rather. Let's pretend that Europe is a giant sandwich. You got some bratwurst here, some Swiss cheese here, some turkey there, and a kosher pickle down there. That would make the UK and Russia the bread. And it turns out the bread really hates the rest of the sandwich. It's like sourdough. Can we put a frowny face on the bread? Nice. So the question is, how do you compete in a popularity contest when you're currently fighting with the hosts? The Russian strategy is to carefully select your song to change the narrative. The UK strategy is to embrace the inevitable and send a song that pisses everyone off as much as possible. Let's start with Russia. Moscow's relationship with the EU has been increasingly tense since the ascent of Vladimir Putin. Russia sends more than half of its exports to Europe, so EU initiatives like the Third Energy Package in 2011 were perceived as blatant economic warfare. But even more concerning to the Kremlin was the Eastern Partnership in 2009, an attempt to bring the former Soviet states closer to the West. Things really came to a head in 2014 when Russia annexed the Crimean Peninsula of Ukraine, a country that had expressed interest in becoming an EU member. However, keep in mind that just because Russia's relationship with the EU is frosty doesn't mean its Eurovision prospects are dim. In fact, Russia has been one of the most successful competitors of the past decade, finishing in the top 10 seven times and winning in 2008. You might be tempted to say that's just because there are a lot of Eurovision countries that have strong cultural ties to Russia. For instance, last year Russia got 12 televoting points from Belarus, Azerbaijan, and Estonia, but they also got 12 points from Germany. And that's got to make Putin happy. So what's different this year? Well, Ukraine won in 2016 with an explicitly anti-Russian song. It was ostensibly about Stalin's invasion of Crimea in 1944, thus its title, but pretty clearly it was about the ongoing war. And a lot of people, including us, feel like some of the votes for Jamala were really votes against Russia. So for 2017, Russia faced a tough choice. Either send a singer to Kiev, the capital of a foreign nation it is currently in armed conflict with, or sit it out and potentially be branded a sore loser. Russia chose door number three, and whatever you think of them, you've got to admit, this was kind of brilliant. First, they selected Yulia Samoylova, who suffers from spinal muscular atrophy and has been in a wheelchair since childhood. So right away, the PR dynamics of the whole Russia-Ukraine situation changed. If you criticized Russia, then you were criticizing this poor young woman in a wheelchair. And if you cheered the woman in the wheelchair, you were cheering Russia. And if you were so cynical as to think that Russia would be this cynical, well, then you were stooping down to their level. And then the other shoe dropped. It turned out that Yulia had performed in Crimea in 2015. Now, it's a violation of Ukrainian law to enter Crimea through Russia. And so Ukraine banned Yulia from entering the country again. This move put Ukraine on the hot seat with a lot of people, including the European Broadcasting Union, who said, we have to respect the local laws of the host country. However, we are deeply disappointed in this decision as we feel it goes against both the spirit of the contest and the notion of inclusivity that lies at the heart of its values. It's true that there is a certain expectation that as the host of an international event, you make an effort to be as accommodating as possible. Earlier this year, Iran hosted the Women's World Chess Championship, and a number of players boycotted because Iran insisted that all players wear a headscarf. People criticized Iran and the World Chess Federation for insisting they compete under those conditions, and they had a point. You can also make a case that Ukraine is well within its rights to assert its own laws. Maybe the pressure should be on Russia to pick a singer that's not banned from entering the country, rather than on Ukraine to make exceptions to a pre-existing policy. But wherever you come down on that question, wow, has Russia played this smart. Instead of having to be a punching bag in Kiev, they get to stay home and make Ukraine look like the bad guys. It would be like if you get invited to the wedding of your ex and you really don't want to go, so you RSVP with a, a child from the Make-A-Wish Foundation as your plus one. Your ex tells you that there's a no children policy, so you regretfully announce that you won't be able to make it. 
The United Kingdom's rupture with the EU was more recent. It's hard to believe that at the time of last year's Eurovision, Brexit was considered a remote possibility. But Britain has been swept up in a global shift rightward, largely in response to anti-immigrant sentiment. In June 2016, the UK stunned the world, including itself, by voting to withdraw from the European Union. This will be a years-long process with many heated negotiations on trade, immigration, financial services, and more. But more importantly, Brexit is not going to improve Britain's Eurovision odds. Unlike Russia, the UK has struggled in Eurovision recently. Over the last 10 years, they've only finished in the top 10 once, and they finished last twice. So making enemies with the entire European Union is really something they could do without. Maybe if David Cameron had focused more on that, he'd still be Prime Minister today. The only thing that can save them from the dreaded null points is a great song that cannot be misinterpreted as being about Brexit. I, will never give up on you. I don't know if it's possible to get less than zero points, but we are going to find out. Never Give Up On You is a song about how Britain is never going to give you up, never going to let you down, never going to tell a lie and desert you. And almost every lyric is infuriating if you think of it in light of the UK's recent decision to ditch Europe. You're not defeated, you're in repair. Don't have to call me, I'll always be there. We'll stand tall so you don't. Just to be clear, Britain has literally voted to give up on the very people who will be voting on their song, I Will Never Give Up On You. And this would be like if you get invited to the wedding of your ex, so you invite a call girl as your date, and the two of you spend the whole night making out by the open bar. So, one of these songs isn't competing at all, and the other has the deck stacked against it. But putting all that stuff aside, are these songs any good? The Russian video is a live performance. Yulia is pretty, she's charismatic, and remember that one of the symptoms of her degenerative muscular disorder is respiratory problems, so she may not have the raw power of a Jamala or a Dami Im, but for a whole host of reasons, her singing is damn impressive. However, the song itself is pretty boring. It's a mid-tempo pop ballad by Leonid Gutkin, who was also involved in Russia's inspirational female ballads in 2013 and 2015. He's the inspirational female ballad guy over there, and apparently it takes him two years to write a song. But this one just kind of plods along without a lot of lyrical sophistication, but with a lot of one from column A, one from column B songwriting. At least What If from 2013 had the big key change in the insane music video. What if we And A Million Voices had that part where they tried really hard to get everyone to clap. Flame is Burning doesn't have the kind of epic build a Eurovision ballad needs. For Exhibit A, please see Conchita Verst. There's one moment, though, that seems like a comment on the current situation. Everybody's talking about the reasons. Just like we are right now. Hey, maybe she's seen our videos. But she couldn't care less. I wanna feel the power. I wanna go to places I don't know. Oh, do you? Which places would those be? Kiev, perhaps? Also, isn't there an article missing here? Shouldn't it be, a flame is burning, or the flame is burning? I Will Never Give Up On You is a stronger song, but one that doesn't say much. Lucy Jones does get a chance to show off her pipes near the end. The mountains climbed, the oceans crossed. Okay, that was six seconds of dramatic wailing. But that's nothing compared with one of our favorite singers from this year, Lindita. Albania's betting odds are just about as low as they can possibly get, but I don't care. This woman is a goddamn force of nature. Shine, 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 shine. 
we actually uh, we don't have time to show you how long Lindita goes without taking a breath here. But rest assured, it's a lot longer than Lucy Jones. Fun fact about Lucy though, her big break was appearing on The X Factor in the UK way back in 2009. Guess who she was eliminated by? Too late, swept away, feel the rush after that. Oh man, I miss those guys. United Kingdom, please send Jedward next year. You're not going to stand a chance of winning for a long, long time. So you might as well just have some fun with it. Send Engelbert Humperdinck again, or Jeremy Clarkson, or Theresa May, or Thomas the Tank Engine. Thomas might win, actually. He is a very useful engine. We'll see you next time.